Good afternoon, everybody. So good to see everybody again this year, despite the fact we're in the second year of a pandemic of all things. But nonetheless, A2 Tech 360 uh, continues. And we're so excited that this particular program happens to be uh, one of the most popular. Uh, it becomes obvious as we uh, hear from our guest speakers. The program is called What the Future Holds, 2031. Basically, we've invited some experts to share with us their thinking, belief, where they think we are going as, um, as a people uh, over the course of the next 10 years, what kinds of exciting things are going to, to happen, what the game changers are that uh, we have to look forward to uh, in the next 10 years. And we've got an outstanding panel covering basically four different um, areas of interest. First off, we're gonna hear from the NIH. Then we're gonna hear about blockchain and crypto and all that, which is highly um, you know, on the top of a lot of people's minds these days, has been for a few years, fairly new, but where's it going? Um, and we're gonna hear about security. Of course, we're all very concerned and interested in, in learning about how we can continue to protect ourselves. Uh, and then lastly, a very exciting presentation from a representative that uh, is gonna look familiar to a lot of us uh, from NASA. So we've got great content today and I'm very excited. Uh, I do need to thank the folks at um, the University of Michigan Tech Transfer Office, or what used to be the Tech Transfer Office. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But uh, anyway, my good friend Mike Saratakis is with us, and here's how the program is going to go. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of the four speakers. If you've got questions as the presentations go along, type them into the chat. Uh, that's where we're going to pull the questions from later not immediately after each presentation. Uh, the four panelists are gonna to come together at the end and we'll do a mass Q&A at that point and we'll be pulling the questions that you're asking from that chat uh, feature. So that's where you go to ask your questions. And then um, after that, I think, uh, I think we'll, be, we'll be good to go. We're, we're excited about getting started. So let's do that. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, Matt McMahon, who is the director of SEED with the National Institute, uh, Institute of Health. SEED stands for the Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development. It helps uh, to transform cutting edge technologies into products that improve health and save lives. The SEED team educates and assists NIH funding innovators, of which we have many in the state of Michigan, as they transition from discovery science to product development. Uh, the SEED helps academic innovators validate the potential health impacts of their discoveries through a national network of proof of concept centers. And they fund the NIH $1.2 billion a year uh, in SBIR and STTR uh, programs. Matt has a diverse background in academia, small business, congressional policy, and NIH program uh, management. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you now, Matt McMahon. Matt, welcome. Thanks for being here. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Skip. Uh, I really appreciate being invited to come here. Thank you to all the organizers. It's a real honor to represent NIH. Um, people often tell me that some of my ideas and my thoughts are way out there, but I wasn't sure that they meant way out there like 2031. So I'll try and... Um, I'll try and do my best to tell you a little bit about where NIH is at right now and the, the status of where we are. And I'll also provide some of my own kind of educated guesses about where we're going in the future. And hopefully that will stimulate some, some good discussion. So I, I wanna start by just talking a little bit about the role of NIH in innovation. Um, and I, I want to I kind of make sure people understand that the, the NIH mission is both to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems, but also to apply that knowledge to enhance health, 
lengthen life and reduce illness and disability. And that's why the tagline of NIH is turning discovery into health. So it's, it's kind of a common, um, a, a bit of a common misconception that the National Institutes of Health funds basic science research. And then all of that application and commercial development and patient impact happens somewhere else. But what I wanna to talk to you about today is about um, the role of NIH in a vibrant R&D pipeline. And I really think that that is a major theme that's gonna continue as we go forward into the next decade. So I'll start by showing this graphic here. This is just to remind us all that it is a seriously perilous road between a good idea on the left-hand side of this slide and a useful healthcare solution that really has impact in people's lives all the way on the right. Um, it's partly based on the success of the COVID mRNA vaccine um, but there's a really, there's an increased public impatience with how long and complicated this pipeline is. Um, it, you know, it's, it's in, in the space that we work in, especially in therapeutic development, but also in, in medical devices, it's, it's oftentimes many, many years between a research discovery and a product that um, you can get from your healthcare provider. And based on really clear feedback from investors and industry folks and healthcare experts, we know that it's not good enough for NIH just to stick in the left side of this slide and, and support early stage discovery. We also need to really help investigators plan ahead and position their projects to get to the finish line. And we wanna help them do that by helping them de-risk their discoveries enter into the early stages of product development and really understand all of those entrepreneurial aspects that are going to be critical for their success. I, I sometimes think of that as, as process literacy because we're not really, we're not necessarily trying to turn basic science researchers into business people, but we really want basic science researchers to have a clear understanding of what it takes to turn their discovery into a healthcare solution and to be able to position their projects effectively to do that. So NIH has a number of programs that sit at some of these different translational chasms that, that many of you are familiar with. Um, the first one I'll mention is our National Network of Proof of Concept Centers. And they're scattered all around the country. There's over a hundred academic institutions now that are a member of one of these centers or hubs. And what they do is they provide funding for early stage proof of concept product validation work. They provide product development expertise and they provide connections with local industry mentors and um, and in combination with that, a, a mindset that's centered around milestone-driven project management, which is really a, a kind of a rather unique contribution to the university environment. And that network has been around for about seven years. And that concept of bringing that type of a proof of concept, early stage product development network into the academic world has been really successful. We've funded about 380 R&D projects so far, and they've resulted in 88 startup companies and one and a half billion dollars in private sector follow-on funding. So that's not, for, that's not subsequent government investment, that's private sector investment. And that's based on $52 million of total NIH investment in this network. So there's a tremendous leveraging that's occurring here um, and we're pushing these, um, these projects out into the private sector where they can really have a big impact on people. And in fact, one of the center, one of the initial centers that we funded was at the Cleveland Clinic and Cleveland Clinic partnered with the University of Michigan. They joined that proof of concept center. And there've been six projects that came out of the University of Michigan. And I have to admit that they are some of our best projects uh, in the entire network. So 
every one of those projects except for one is being developed by a startup company or a small business. And those projects have raised $16.8 million in follow-on funding. And one of them is in, is in um, early stage clinical trials right now. So it's an example of how these networks can really help the universities to push that technology out and make it available to patients. Um, if you jump over to the next translational chasm there, um, once we start pushing these, these discoveries out into the wild, most of the time that happens by licensing to small businesses. And as Skip mentioned, we are actually the largest seed stage funder in the life sciences in the world. We give out over $1.2 billion in small business program funding every year. And for, for the investors out there, that's completely non-dilutive funding. So our portfolio at any one time um, could have, I, I don't know, anywhere between 1,000 and, and 1,500 awards. Um, we actually have 50 active projects right now in Michigan, and they're supported by $21 million in NIH funding. So we, we try and have, um, we, we're, we're interested in diversity at NIH, but we're interested broadly in diversity. We're interested in diversity of personal backgrounds, diversity of um, the type of innovator, geographical diversity, we're interested in people from, from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, uh, we're trying very hard to increase the number of women and, and innovators um, from minority backgrounds. So we're really trying to um, just expand this innovation ecosystem as much as we can. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about COVID because, you know, a lot of times we feel like we're in a new normal right now. COVID has really changed the way um, that we operate and the way we think about innovation um, at NIH. It's, it's a good example though, that to illustrate this holistic response to a healthcare crisis. And I really believe that this holistic integrated approach is, is kind of like the, the wave of the future for where NIH is going to go. So in this slide, you can see the different components of NIH's strategic response for COVID-19. So the first part is to improve fundamental knowledge that, that's required to understand COVID. That's the basic science research everybody understands. Um, then we, we also want to do a improve, improve research to improve detection, and that centers around the RADx program or the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics program, and I'll talk about that in a second. The third part is support to research advanced treatments. Um, that is maybe most um, visible to people through the active clinical trial network, which has been working diligently um, to, to support and test advanced treatments. Um, and then prevention, priority number four, um, very important, not just for COVID, but for many of our biggest healthcare challenges. And number five is really to try and do everything we can to understand and address health disparities across the United States. If, if co one of the major things COVID, I think is just laid bare, is the, the striking healthcare disparities across our country. And I think we all need to think hard about where those disparities come from and try and come up with the most evidence-based ways to address them. So the RADx program I mentioned is developing diagnostic tests for COVID. We were called on very early um, in the pandemic to help develop tests that could really um, fill that gap of, of, of finding COVID in its early stages, um, find, enabling home tests for COVID. Um, you can see on this slide, there's a real diversity of technologies and use cases that are here, ranging from home lateral flow tests to lab-based tests to tests that employ, employ CRISPR technology. Um, right in the center is the Illum test. The first home use test was developed with support from NIH. Um, 
Another thing, though, that I want to use this, this slide to, to illustrate is one of the other main lessons from COVID that I think is going to carry on into the next decade, which is a renewed appreciation and requirement for strong interagency collaboration. So in order for us to come up with these tests and get them onto the market as fast as we could, it required just hand-in-glove communication between NIH and the FDA. We actually had weekly meetings with the FDA in vitro diagnostics team. And that was really a two-way street. The, that communication allowed the FDA to, to get an early preview of the most advanced technologies, that many of which they'd never reviewed before, to see them and think about them before they arrived on their doorstep with an application. And it also benefited us and the innovators because we could get some insight into that regulatory landscape and what the FDA was thinking about how they were going to evaluate these products. And that communication really cut a lot of the time that's required to get through the regulatory process. Um, I see that in the future moving forward, not just on the regulatory side, but also on the reimbursement and payment side. So right now, even if you're successful at developing a healthcare product, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how that product is going to be paid for. And many early stage innovators, it's not even really on their radar screen um, how their product is going to be paid for. But from an investor's point of view, oftentimes that's one of the most critical aspects of, of evaluating a project. So I think in the future, there's going to be much more interagency collaboration, much more communication that ties together early innovation, considerations about regulatory approval, considerations about um, reimbursement and payment, either through CMS or with private payers. And also, you know, we've had a lot of um, interaction and discussions with the DOD around manufacturing scale up and distribution. And that's really been an eye opener, too, because I think many people understand that um, in the United States, there's the, the healthcare market is so price competitive that we need to think about for these early innovations, like for COVID tests, we, we stimulated that market by purchasing so many of these tests early on, and we continue to do that. So I think there are broader discussions to be had in the next decade about the role of government in, in stimulating those healthcare markets for early stage technologies. Um, this is another example. So not only did we develop these tests, but we worked together with the CDC to get those tests into the hands of people who need them, needed them the most. And we developed a, a direct-to-consumer model where people in targeted communities that were cho chosen based on um, the COVID dynamics in, in their area, and also the, the number of vulnerable people in those communities. When we launched this program, people could come to a website, order a test, and have it delivered to their doorstep, a, a kit that contained multiple tests, and have it delivered to their doorstep free of charge. And it was fast, cheap, simple. It was a great program um, that really shows how not only did we did we stimulate early innovation for test development, we, we barreled our way through the initial stages of development, innovation, FDA approval. And not only that, we went direct to consumers with those tests through the Say Yes COVID test program. Um, so that's an excellent example. But you know there are some there are some real problems that we uncovered too, which is it's not good enough just to make the tests available. We learned a lot about hesitancy for people to continue testing. Um, and, and I think issues around that and around vaccine hesitancy have really pointed out another major theme, which is that technology isn't the solution to all of our problems. Technology isn't enough. In the future, we're gonna have to work much harder to combine technology development with social science and behavioral economics to understand how we can not only develop new cutting edge technologies, but effectively integrate them into society. That's definitely gonna be a major theme 
going forward. Um, I, there are no better examples than that. There's no better example than vaccine hesitancy. Um, I, I mean, it's maybe one of our most celebrated successes that you know I can even imagine. The fact that that an mRNA vaccine was developed and distributed with such speed is a tremendous technological success, but it is a tremendous failure that um, we've, we, we're not able to have that vaccine penetrate its way across um, our population in a way that we need to protect ourselves. So that, that leads to even an even more forward-looking vision for what could be happening at NIH. So many of you have probably heard that the Biden-Harris administration has proposed a DARPA-like entity for healthcare, an advanced research projects agency for healthcare. And that, that um, proposal is now um, working its way through the process of being developed, um, of being funded by the Congress. ARPA-H is really a radical way to push this vision of closing the gap between science and innovation and patient impact. Um, the idea is to pick priority projects that focus on our most pressing healthcare challenges, build a multidisciplinary team around them, and use these DARPA models that provide a flexible, nimble approach to selecting and funding processes that's very different from the standard linear model or the standard NIH grant-based model and really attack some of these big, big problems like obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, opioid epidemic, the, you know, the list goes on and on. But ARPA-H is really a way to take that linear development process and just fold it right back on top of itself so that you can find the most important barriers to addressing a problem and address them as fast as you can wherever they might, might be, whether those barriers are fundamental basic science problems, technology development problems, manufacturing problems, or deployment problems, you have a single team that works together in parallel to, to make all of that happen. So we're very excited about um, what ARPA-H will become, how it will develop in the next 10 years. And that's really um, the, probably the, uh, the single, one of the single most uh, uh, radical changes that you'll see at NIH going forward. But, you know, I can't even begin to give a talk like this today, um, you know, one or two days after the announcement that Francis Collins will be stepping down as the NIH director. Francis Collins has been leading the National Institutes of Health for over a decade. Um, he, he championed so many of the changes to NIH that, that we recognize now as being critical to our success. He formed a new institute, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Um, he's pushed forward our efforts on diversity and addressing structural racism. Um, he strengthened the connection between our basic science and our clinical research enterprise. And um, we have so much, uh, there, we owe such a debt to Francis Collins for his leadership. But as we look into the future, um, and part of the reason why Francis Collins explained that he was leaving is because it, he felt that it was time um, to bring in some new leadership, some fresh leadership, and take NIH into the next decade. So um, I don't really have any predictions about where that's going to go, but I'm extremely excited about where NIH will be going. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm very sad to see Francis Collins step down, as we all are, but we're very much looking forward to a bright future in the next 10 years at NIH. So thank you, Skip, for having me. And I'm, I'm going to be happy to participate in the Q&A later on. Matt, we're thrilled you were able to join us. We're excited about uh, the changes that uh, has all, have already been implemented in NIH. And it uh, looks like several more with new leadership. You always get new ideas, too. So that's coming. But you know, Francis, this photo that you showed of Francis was kind of interesting. You never, I never would have thought him to be a motorcyclist necessarily, but it was a great photo. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm sure you generated a lot of questions 
And so just a reminder to everybody, questions, write them in the uh, chat. And then we'll be asking those at the end when all of our presenters come back together. Our next uh, presentation is from Minyan Liu, who is the Peter and Evelyn Fuss Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering and a Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at U of M. She received her PhD uh, in Electrical Engineering from the University of Maryland, but then moved to U of M wisely where she's been since the year 2000. Professor Liu's research interests are in optimal resource allocation, sequential decision theory, incentive design, and performance modeling and analysis, all within the context of large-scale network systems. Her most recent research activities involve cyber risk quantification and designing cybersecurity incentive mechanisms using large-scale internet measurement data and machine learning techniques. Uh, it's with great pleasure I introduce Mingyan Liu. Thank you for being with us. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Skip, for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Matt just said, um, what I'm about to say are best qualified as educated guesses. And, and I will also say, you know, as much as these could be called predictions, I think they're also my wish lists. So they're more reflection of what I'm hoping to see more so than what I know or think I, we will see. Now, if I could put everything that's come to mind in one word that's front and center, that word is sustainability. I think sustainability will be coming, it will be, be a bigger and bigger issue and hopefully a more and more prominent driving force behind innovation, tech transfer and entrepreneurial activities. Uh, my own field, as you just heard, is in electrical and computer engineering. So I'll make some observations of research and IP activities in this space that are relevant to this trend. And I'll mention a few broad categories of these. First is I think we're seeing and we'll see more, a lot of innovations in processes, design, and materials. A very good example of this is how is low power electronics with existing materials. This has been uh, a major area of IP and U of M has been a big player in this space. And I could expect we'll see more innovation. Second, more interesting area is what's called post CMOS material. CMOS is the, the bedrock of the current silicon-based hardware computing paradigm. So post CMOS material development has to do with looking beyond this paradigm as we approach the limit in terms of the number of elements or transistors that we can pack in the unit space. The CMOS scaling limit especially uh, essentially put a cap on device density and speeds due to heating effects. So this is a very active research area where new materials are being designed with the goal of enabling a possible future digital logic technology beyond the CMOS scaling limit. Now, most of this technology still lives in uh, labs, and it's certainly true that the vast majority of the industry is, uh, I would say, still betting on getting more mileage out of CMOS. Uh, by using better processes and other innovations. But I think in another five years or so, if not sooner, we'll begin to see some of these technologies uh, starting to mature. Second broad category is uh, innovation in energy renewables, energy conversion, energy storage. Right? We're seeing much more efficient photovoltaic technologies. Again, U of M has been a very big player in this space. Um, but Energy storage uh, similarly is, is um, shining a light on some very non-conventional problems, fascinating ones that you wouldn't think about. I'll give you a very interesting example uh, that I heard very recently. You know, If you drive an electric car, you probably feel very good about moving away from fossil fuel. But do you know that when those batteries need to be replaced, most of them actually still have a lot of life left in them? But they just cannot be used in cars anymore. Why? Because we pack many batteries in a single vehicle and each and every one of them actually deteriorates differently. That's just the physics and chemistry of how these batteries operate. And the minute they deteriorate sufficiently differently, we just cannot work, 
work with, they cannot be used together anymore. So now that brings the big picture, a big question of what do you do with them? Because they have a lot of life left. Uh, how do we, we don't want to recycle them necessarily. How do we reuse them? We're starting to see algorithmic control innovations about um, how to smartly compensate for the differences in circuit design in system design so they can be uh, actually repurposed for other uses. And I expect we'll see more interesting development innovation in that space. Um, the third category I'll, I want to mention is AI and sustainability. Uh, the current AI is extremely power hungry. Is it sustainable um, as a proof of concept? Uh, I think that's okay, but can it really be widely adopted given its energy consumption and should it? It's already the case that certain tasks can only be performed by very few entities in the world not because others do not have the know-how, but they don't have the computing and energy resources. Um, a related issue with the current AI technology is it is extremely data hungry. And this has fueled heavy concentration of consumer data and opaque trading of consumer data. And it has led to massive privacy issues that I, I don't think I need to get into here. Um, there are a lot of activities, uh, some of them very promising uh, on the subject of edge AI. How to harness the power of AI on local edge devices using only local data or using some combination with local and central, centralized computing. Um, there are hardware innovations aimed at this type of edge AI tasks. There are families of algorithms federated learning being one of them that are being developed. Um, some of them are being piloted in a specific domains such as healthcare. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind, we're gonna see more of this type of AI technologies. Uh, incidentally, I'm part of a uh, new $25 million NSF AI Institute on using AI to build the next generation of wireless edge networks. And I'm very excited. Uh, to work with my collaborators, see what kind of innovations uh, we can have there. So in short, I hope to see future AI technologies that are less data hungry, less power hungry, or in other words, more human-like, human brains learn very, with very few data points. Um, last but not least, I'm increasingly beginning to see cybersecurity, something that I am quite familiar with, as a matter of sustainability because it impacts technology growth, uh, as well as our physical and mental health, as more and more of our work and life are, you know, they now exist in the cyberspace. One of the things I'm personally interested in is making cyber risk quantification be part of uh, ESG assessment, environmental social governance. Um, this framework is increasingly becoming a way to assess socially responsible corporate governance. And I really believe cyber ought to be part of this assessment framework. Um, I will end this by echoing what Matt said toward the end, which is technology is not the solution to all our problems. Uh, as an engineer, you know, I represent the segment who likes to use technology to address problems uh, created by older technologies. Um, I think when it comes to sustainability, we really need advances in other areas and work together to solve some of these uh, grand challenges. With that, I'm going to hand this back to Skip. Yan, thank you very much. We certainly are uh, going to be facing some of these challenges in the future and we're glad smart people like yourself are uh, looking into it and providing us potentially uh, solutions around uh, the challenges ahead. So next, let me introduce Dr. Adrian, uh, Peter Adrians, a professor of environmental engineering, finance and entrepreneurship at U of M with appointments in civil and environmental engineering at the Ross School of Business and School of Environment and Sustainability. He directs the Center and Master of Engineering program in Smart Infrastructure Finance, focused on efficient financing mechanisms for public and private infrastructure systems. His research and teaching focus on data-driven business and finance models for infrastructure, blockchain applications for smart cities, and artificial intelligence 
learning for asset pricing of sustainability premiums in bonds and equities. I, I'm sure he's going to get into all of this. I look forward to his presentation. Peter, take it away. Thanks for uh, having me at the 2031 event to talk a little bit to you about blockchain fintech and the asset tokenization opportunity. Just for context, about a decade ago or so, I was working on data-driven business models uh, for uh, new entrepreneurial uh, businesses, which uh, led me into a sabbatical I was able to take up in uh, Finland in the Nordics. And it gave me exposure to a whole new opportunity I hadn't thought about before. That is this, the digitization uh, and, and the, the broader digitization of the economy and the, the digitization of finance. So what that really means is how can algorithms be used to actually make decisions on financial investments uh, for uh, economic development. And so about five years ago, six years ago, I came back from Finland and uh, back at the University of Michigan, and the question was, and now what? I mean, I'd had a chance to essentially look at the design and development of financial technology models for the Finnish economy. And back at Michigan, uh, uh, I started back again at civil environmental engineering. And um, we, we asked the question, how do we better integrate sort of finance and financial questions in the context of of infrastructure. And definitely it's very pertinent right now as we're talking about infrastructure bills um, up on the hill and uh, figuring out how we're going to be paying for those. So what I did uh, about five years ago is we started a new center and it was called the Center for Smart Infrastructure Finance. And the whole idea was how do we use all the data that are being generated by all infrastructure assets, whether they are water, or energy or roads or broadband or whatever kind of infrastructure one can think of and integrate those into sort of, you know, automated algorithmic based decisions to, you know, make investments in these different assets as efficiently as possible. So this center has now been running for about five years. Um, it was uh, supported by um, several industries as well as blockchain companies. And we built a master's program around this as well. So now we have a master, we have a center for smart infrastructure finance and a master on smart infrastructure finance to actually educate engineers better in the financial and fintech financial technology opportunity. I mean, fintech, the word fintech kind of means that we're integrating finance with technology into the context of, of algorithms and models. And that's where we're at right now. So the center really focuses around efficient financing models for intelligent systems. But let's, let's zoom out a little bit here because this whole fintech market opportunity has been around for a while, has been around from before I came back to, to Michigan after my sabbatical. And so fintech is actually much broader than just investment or capital markets technology to make better decisions and, and, and for stock markets or bonds. And it goes into business process outsourcing, security technologies, payroll tech, um, insurance in short tech, I guess, as we call it. So basically in all these areas of contracting, uh, lending, commerce, um, financial media, data solutions, et cetera, they're essentially all contracts. So how, does these, how can these contracts be made more um, efficient, automated, and potentially, I mean, even rules-based, right? And that is essentially what FinTech is. So it's about financial performance tracking. It's about automated uh, risk allocation adjustments uh, as we uh, move forward in any of these areas of financial technology. And, and, and particularly for my interest and also in the infrastructure space, it's also about the integration of and, and, and compliance with uh, uh, ESG metrics. ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance, uh, key performance indicators. I mean, more and more as we're looking at making investments in anything, whether it's in real estate or infrastructure uh, or, or commerce and whatnot, we're looking at sort of these, that edge, these, these what we call alternative factors uh, that make decisions on the value of a financial investment, and that's ESG. FinTech, the space of FinTech at large, when you look at all these, these sectors here, has been growing at about 22% corporate average growth rate. Uh, ESG investments per se, 
so that's just a subset of that. It's been growing about 25%. And then if you're looking at the ESG data, which is, again, that integration of, 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 of environmental, social, and governance parameters or metrics into the financial decision-making uh, has been growing uh, at, at a rate of about 37% CAGR. So from my, percent, from, from my perspective, this has become a very exciting, very fast-growing uh, opportunity in many different spaces. So blockchain is really sort of a subset of that, right? So, the, I mean, blockchain is, 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 I mean, very often we, we identify fintech as being blockchain, and it's not exactly the same. So blockchain is a subset of fintech. That is where we have kind of these automated distributed ledger systems that, that, that um, uh, provide enhanced security uh, to the real-time digital economic process. That's where we keep track of transactions where we make transactions transparent, where we make sure that transactions cannot be corrupted uh, and whatnot. Now, the blockchain opportunity actually is very broad as well because there's many different components in a blockchain economy. It goes all the way from the cryptocurrencies, all of us are hearing about, particularly being discussed on the Hill, uh, the recent decisions by China to no longer allow any crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies, to decentralized finance, which is really all about I'll, I'll get into that in a second, into decision-making, not in a centralized fashion by one central trusted agency or financial institution, but do it in a distributed fashion to uh, the non-fungible tokens that we all hear about in the context of art. So if you look at the blockchain opportunity, you really have sort of a broad set of different types of companies, and we need a different type of companies to make the blockchain work. So we have custody, wallet, and digital asset services. So this is basically the wallets that we own that actually have the, you know, the currencies, uh, the currencies stored in them that we can make transactions with. There's the whole infrastructure that needs to get built out in order to move, you know, the currencies around the the industry ecosystem. There are the exchanges where you know coins are being traded, coins are being transacted. Uh, there's the capital markets, of course, that that that. Um, are getting involved in this and capital markets get involved from, from the perspective of the, that they are seeing efficiencies in sort of these digital algorithmic opportunities that relate to, to financial decision making. Uh, naturally, we have uh, uh, regulatory uh, and, and security aspects of that as well. I mean, again, think about what's currently going on um, with the Securities and Exchange Commission and Ripple, this whole decision of is a cryptocurrency, you know, is it a security or is it a true currency? And it has tax implications and all sorts of other uh, implications. The mining, uh, mining of, of, of currencies, very big component, a very uh, a major energy drain, at least when it comes to um, you know, the proof of work mechanism of mining, there was consensus mechanisms of mining. I don't want to get into all of that. So people are looking for can we can we essentially authenticate and validate these transactions sort of in an energy efficient way, um, payments and commerce and whatnot. So blockchain in and by itself, as I said, is very broad. So let's take a little deeper dive on you know two components at least of it. Uh, first, the DeFi. Right, so DeFi is this, as I said, decentralized finance. It's really all about disrupting the financial system, right? And the entire idea here is that the current, the financial system as we know it, um, it has been controlled and has been regulated and has been based on having centralized authorities, right? Centralized authorities such as banks, regulators, central banks, and whatnot. And so the question is, can we actually come up with a uh, more of a, a democratized fashion, I guess, of making financial decisions. And democratized, of course, means decentralized, because it means essentially, can we have parties that inherently don't trust each other or not part of a trusted system to come up with a consensus that a transaction is a valid transaction? And that's really where decentralized finance comes in. Now, we're setting this up in the context of, of, uh, of algorithms again. Uh, so these are uh, essentially, it's an optimization type of algorithm of very different parties, very different validators, take part in verifying whether a transaction is true or not. 
instead of a bank saying a transaction is true or not. Now, there's, there's multiple benefits to that. People would say, why on earth would you want to do that since we have the banking system and you know, I mean, it, it, it works very efficient. It is also a very expensive system. Uh, there is all sorts of fees layered on, there are delays layered on. So can we actually make decisions in real time and in, in real time and at lower cost? I mean, it's almost, think about it, of the, the old bartering system that we used to have where you barter with one another and now we algorithmize bartering and actually make a decision in the digital ecosystem as to whether or not a transaction is a true transaction or not. Um, we have actually U of M is involved in multiple fashions in decentralized finance. One, uh, we, we actually have a Ripple ledger. Uh, so we're a Ripple validator, um, uh, and that is uh, uh, the validator is actually at the University of Michigan as part of a, a larger uh, gift agreement uh, between Ripple, uh, the College of Engineering, the School of Public Policy, and the Ross School of Business. Uh, Blockchain at Michigan, which is a student club, actually a very popular student club, uh, uh, is involved by itself in be becoming a validator of, of Uniswap. So basically, they have, they have the rights to make decisions on whether or not $63 million worth of transactions in of Unis are valid transactions or not. So they do that. It's again, it's by way of an algorithm uh, that uh, uh, helps make the decision uh, on these on these transactions. As you see, it's an exploding sector. It's about currently about a hundred billion dollar sector. But if you look at that inflection point over here, it's really only recently uh, taken off um, like crazy. Uh, and, and no surprise that currently central banks are stepping in and whatnot as as these systems sort of become a threat to the established system. But again, disruption of disruption of industries is, I mean, ultimately what, what uh, entrepreneurship is all about. Um, the What has gotten a lot of sort of um, uh, media attention are the non-fungible tokens, right? This is really about monetizing non-interchangeable goods. So what that means is anything from uh, YouTube videos to music to to art, to digital art, to, um, to blogs and whatnot could become monetized uh, in, in, in all sorts of uh, payment um, uh, through, through a micropayment and other payment systems. So essentially what we create as art, whether it's in music, whether it's in video, whether it is in games, whether it is in writing, can become monetized and sold in what we call this non-fungible token market. Uh, it did about the $338 million in transaction volume in, in 2020, which is still peanuts when you compare it to the global collectibles market that includes you know, the, whole, the physical world, right? Games, toys, cars, physical trading cards, which is, I mean, orders of magnitude higher, 370 billion. And so people are looking at, you know, how can, you know, and when we say non-interchangeable, I mean, every piece is considered to be unique. Every piece that's being generated, a car, a collectible trading card, a piece of art is unique. So therefore it is a non-interchangeable good that gets sold as a, as a digital asset. Um, but then uh, it can be traded over a blockchain such that just like, you know, the art market uh, in auctions where the value can either go up or go down. I mean, presumably mainly goes up. So this is a, a market has just been taking off. Been taking off. We even have certain moves of basketball players, of football players that they own, that they say this is unique to, you know, this player, that NFL player, that NBA player, and they can actually monetize even that particular move. So, so let's go back beyond that because our focus really has been on digital financing of real assets. So when we talk about real assets, we talk about infrastructure, right? And this is this opportunity here is the integration of IoT, Internet of Things enabled uh, infrastructure data streams and financial models. So 5G is getting a lot more integrated in our roadways. You think about Southeast Michigan, uh, the DOT in collaboration with, with energy companies and others, I mean, are implementing sensors along the roads such that we can uh, make, make autonomous vehicles uh, function more, uh, um, uh, allow uh, autonomous vehicles to function. Uh, one of the things we want to do with that is can we tokenize some of that infrastructure? Because once you know what the data streams are in infrastructure and what the uses of infrastructure, we can attribute a value to the insights that that infrastructure provides. So you're going to have roads that have more traffic volume, less traffic volume, more commercial volume, less commercial volume, more um, 
uh, you know, uh, association with, 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 with parking fees and revenue, more association with wireless revenue. So basically every infrastructure asset essentially becomes a, a data generator and therefore a value generator. So digital financing and smart contracts are becoming part of real assets. And we see it already in the renewable energy space. We see it in, uh, in, in, in smart water infrastructure and whatnot. We're working a lot with Ripple on this. Uh, so Ripple, again, blockchain company, as well as with a company called Blockchain Triangle, which is uh, whose CEO is a uh, an alum from uh, Darren Wolfberg, is an alum from uh, University of Michigan. And uh, so he set up this company that actually issues tokens or can issue tokens that essentially have both financial performance, track financial performance of an infrastructure asset, and at the same time track the ESG performance, ESG compliance of that infrastructure asset. And guess what? I mean, this company got selected as being one of the top 10 companies invited to the COP26, the climate conference in Glasgow uh, later this year. So it's so a great, this is a great opportunity for all our students as well as for new uh, spin outs uh, to, uh, to emerge. So four key roles we've identified over time for data, uh, data in infrastructure financing, this whole digitization. One, data can reduce the cost of financing and improve liquidity. Uh, in infrastructure, so basically, instead of long-term investors like lenders and private equity and in infrastructure, we can get more uh, efficient investors like some of the insurance companies and whatnot. I mean, getting into infrastructure assets, it allows us to connect operational performance to financial risk and return, and we're already seeing that, where instead of having a fixed interest rate in an infrastructure asset, you're going to have variable interest rates that are tied to financial and operational performance, which we can measure using data. It allows us to unlock new cash flows. Data can be packaged, sold, and actually used as, as collateral against a loan um, or against lending an infrastructure asset. And then, as I mentioned, the whole tokenization opportunity as well. Uh, does Do investors actually care about digitization and fintech and infrastructure? Absolutely. This is a snapshot I took at a conference, the Goldman Sachs conference that brought about every, every who's who in infrastructure management and infrastructure asset investing and public-private partnerships together. And they say, you know what? There's a lot of hidden value in infrastructure assets. So I want to kind of take take you back to, I mean, some of... Um, uh, I mean, movies, I mean, that have come out in the past where people start looking at sort of hidden values in players and hidden values in 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 in, in operations and whatnot. And so basically this this hidden these hidden values that come from data lead to new operational models, lead to new re, lead to new revenue streams, uh, lead to enhanced liquidity and performance-driven financing. And they're starting to pay uh, attention. So lastly, uh, one of the applications here, and this is again, so taken from, from our friends at uh, Blockchain Triangle, which I think is a very exciting application that we're not only applying now to infrastructure assets, but to the entire United States municipal bond market. So basically the question is, and so we look at the left, um, America was built on municipal bonds. Pretty much everything you can think about, whether it's a water system, an energy system, roadway system, broadbands, hospitals, universities, and whatnot, municipal bonds have been a big part of that. Uh, the current municipal bond market is about 3.8 trillion, outstanding. The first municipal bond ever issued in the United States was actually issued in the Great Lakes, the same year University of Michigan was founded, and that was for the... Uh, uh, for the Erie Canal. So all the information on these infrastructure assets and the performance of these infrastructure assets can actually be embedded on, in a rules-based process, on, an, uh, a, a, uh, on a token, a token essentially as a smart contract. So you have performance information and operational performance information, as well as financial performance information, as well as ESG performance information, essentially all on a rules-based contract, a smart contract on, on a token. And these tokens can be sold, can be underwritten by banks, can be underwritten by, can be rated by Moody's, and essentially can be used uh, for investments in infrastructure assets and ultimately provide information to asset managers, to issuers and sponsors, to credit agencies, insurers, and other partners. And on top of that, it will reduce the cost 
of the financing of infrastructure. And if you think about it, what is more important than in the current day and age, as we're dealing with you know, either a $1 trillion infrastructure bill or a $3.5 trillion soft infrastructure bill being discussed, how are we going to pay for all of this, right? That is the bottom question. And the opportunity of fintech integrated with infrastructure, reducing the cost of financing and creating new revenue streams that would allow us to pay for the financing, I think is in a, an, an, an area that is ready to explode. And, and as I said, the, the major investors and major brokerages uh, are already paying attention to this, as well as international uh, financiers. And I want to leave it at that uh, with this sort of overview of where this opportunity goes. And I uh, really appreciate having the chance to uh, chat with you about uh, this, uh, uh, this emerging industry. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Very uh, interesting. I'm sure that uh, you generated a lot of questions in, in the audience, as have the previous two presenters. I have mistakenly told you to go to chat to ask your questions. Actually, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, please put your questions in there. And uh, Mike is going to moderate the Q&A session after our next presentation, which is uh, coming up now with the um, NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. Thomas is probably well known by many uh, who are watching the, the program today. He was a professor of space science and aerospace engineering at U of M. He was the founding director of U of M's Center for Entrepreneurship at the College of Engineering and developed and ran several campus-wide innovation initiatives one of which led to the top-ranked undergraduate entrepreneurship program nationally. Uh, Thomas is Swiss. He was born uh, in Switzerland, went to the University of Bern, where he received his Master of Science in Physics, as well as a doctorate. His honors include multiple NASA Group Achievement Awards, induction as a member of the International Academy of Astronautics, a NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and uh, the 2018 Heinrich Greinacher Prize, a leading science-related recognition from the University of Bern. We're delighted to have Thomas back in town, uh, be it remotely. And so Thomas, it's all yours. Thank you. Hey, I'm Thomas Serpok, and I'm just so excited to speak to you today. Of course, I know the Spark community very well. I worked with you for almost a decade uh, launching the entrepreneurial ecosystem around undergraduates and students of the College of Engineering and all the way beyond the university. I deeply appreciate the friendships I formed there. Many of you are still very close to me. And I want to thank you also, of course, uh, for uh, all you have done and you are doing for the community at large, especially those of you who are hiring uh, people from the university and from the community overall. And all of you who have come together, especially during the last couple of years that were really difficult for so many of your businesses and have steadfast supported the community and your employees. I really wanna express my appreciation. My presentation today is all focused on new horizons. It's about recognizing that so many elements of what we're doing here at NASA, but also what many of you are doing in your uh, companies, in your community, in your non-for-profits, is about reaching new grounds, going beyond new horizons. And what I want to talk to you about today is the experience from a few NASA missions that teach us about really how to go to these uh, new horizons and also stories of individuals and of teams that have achieved that. I already tell you something up front. At the heart of a big project that goes beyond uh, a new horizon and reaches to new goals is a team. Primarily, it's not an individual. I happen to be the head of a NASA Science Mission Directorate, but I have this position with humility because I recognize that the people who are really deserving all the credit are the individuals that make these missions happen. Teams are achieving new goals are going beyond new horizons. And that's really what we're celebrating here today. The first story 
I'm going to tell you about is about a mission that actually has the name New Horizons. So it's a very good start. It's a mission uh, that, uh, of course, uh, launched in January 20, 2006 from Cape Canaveral. And there is no space talk without a beautiful launch picture. And of course, it launched on an Atlas V rocket. And it went through space by Jupiter and all the way out there to really to its goal. And what is shown here uh, is the data that was known before summer 2015, when New Horizons began a, a six months reconnaissance flyby of Pluto and its moons, culminating with the closest approach on July 14th, 2015. Everything that was known before is in that picture. It used the best telescope we have, which is the Hubble Space Telescope, and it captured this image of Pluto in early 2010. Now you realize, looking at this image, that Pluto has structure. You realize uh, that it's probably more exciting in terms of just the overall look and feel, like the moon, like many people have said, well, Pluto is not worth going to. It's so far away and just looks like the moon. You already see that. But what happened in the flyby is, frankly, stunning beyond belief. So let me show you an animation during that flyby uh, in July 14th. The animation show is shown travel from south to north along the western margin of Pluto's heart, which I'm going to show you in a second, called the Sputnik Planitia. On the right, east, uh, they're bright Isis and left, uh, here in the West uh, are dark reds, red terrains. The reddish material indicate the presence of organics, primarily hydrocarbons, produced by photochemistry in Pluto's atmosphere and uh, deposited on the surface. The mountains and craters seen with steep walls are made out of water ice are created with the same red material. You, of course, know this picture, and it has been sent to millions of people on Valentine's Day and before, beyond. And, of course, what it shows is Pluto in its new glory, achieving that new horizon of understanding this planet. The blue and white areas on the right are bright, clean ice. The blue is caused by scattering of light, uh, while the white areas are fresh ice deposited by atmospheric transport. Of course, the yellow created by the rain out of the atmosphere, like the soot particles on surface, uh, radiolysis, and in similar chemistry to the featured on the red terrains to the right. You're looking at this planet and its beauty achieved by a team with a lot of adversity, with a lot of uh, challenges, and frankly, uh, one team that uh, made history and showed us the beauty of that outer world, worlds we've never seen. That is what New Horizons is about. See, I resonate with New Horizons because I grew up in the mountains and I always saw New Horizons, horizons all over. My thoughts, uh, and of course, this is a scene right by the house where I grew up. Uh, you look at the fog in the spring uh, down there in the valleys and you look at the mountains. Some of these mountains are, frankly, Mountains I spent a lot of time on, like Nielsen, right? That triangular mountain right in, uh, ahead of you there. You can hike up and down, no problem. You look more to the left there, and you get into mountains that, frankly, even without, with my training of years in uh, the military and also by other uh, clubs and kind of uh, training I had, I wasn't able to actually get up those mountains. The other thing that's interesting, when you're sitting on top of that mountain, you see new mountains behind it. And so for me, just thinking of kind of the feeling of achieving uh, new horizons using the kind of experience I had of hiking in the mountains is really what I'm going to use in this talk. The first one is all about the discoveries that await by coming together and pushing out. And of course, uh, it's again, uh, the, the, the coming together of teams, but also the alignment behind the vision that is, of course, um, uh, happening when we go to Mars. What we're trying to do, frankly, is an incredibly complex thing. What we're trying to do is, and we're in the process of, is achieving a goal to go to the, 
to a planet, Mars, and come back from it. The reason we want to do that is twofold. First of all, what we want to do is to bring samples back from Mars. Mars, just like the Earth, had a thick atmosphere, had standing water on the surface something like three billion years ago. What happened three billion years ago on Earth is something that changed forever our planet, namely life arose. Our question, of course, is when there was an atmosphere, uh, water on the surface on Mars, did their well, life awake in the, the same way as the, it did on Earth or in a similar fashion. And these samples that we want to bring to the best labs on Earth, the labs right here, uh, of course, uh, uh, and all over the world uh, are samples that we believe have the answer to that particular question. You see, to make that happen is incredibly complex. The first thing we do is we go to the surface of Mars with perseverance. And frankly, we look at collecting these samples using the best instruments for reconnaissance. Uh, instruments that are attached on that rover that we're going to talk about in just a minute. However, that is not the end. What we're going to do is, uh, frankly, uh, go back to Mars and actually launch a launch vehicle, the first launch vehicle off another planet. You've seen the movie The Martian. Remember when the actor goes, uh, the, the, you know, Matt <laughs> goes to the, the launch vehicle and takes off? That's first launch vehicle of that type. We're landing on Mars, and then uh, what we're going to do is launch the samples into orbit, pick it up from orbit. And now I'm going to remind you of the movie Austin Powers. Remember when uh, Austin Powers, uh, or the, uh, you know, the, the picks up uh, a little capsule out there in space? Well, that's what we're going to do near Mars and then bring it back to Earth to our labs. So how do we do that? Uh, that's exactly... Uh, what's the story here? That's what we're going to talk to us about, to you about. So it starts with a launch in July 30, 2020. Now, of course, you look at that date, and I want to tell you, uh, at that day uh, was about the four months anniversary of naming the mission Perseverance. We named the mission Perseverance uh, early March. Uh, 2020, and you all remember, uh, in early March, uh, we COVID was not a thing. It's something we read in the news. And I have to tell you, when I named it Perseverance, that happens to be my job, I got a lot of pushback uh, on that name. It's not inspiring, many people said. It's, uh, it indicates that we ch have challenges. Uh, my question to them was, well, isn't it true that you had challenges, by the way. I've been hanging out with you and we've, everything we do has challenges. And, you know, because of my upbringing in the Swiss mountains, and many of you have your own stories, perseverance was always an important part of my entire career. So I didn't see anything negative. By the time we launched here in July, and here's the, the picture of it, perseverance became a battle cry for the entire teams. What the teams did, frankly, is nothing but stunning. Uh, coming together, we never shut down uh, Mars 2020 uh, Perseverance. We went and got it to the launch pad exactly on time. You remember, of course, that the way you get from Earth to Mars is only in specific times, every 26 months. So if we did not meet that uh, launch window, as we call it, we would have had to wait 26 months. I felt really deeply, and so did my bosses, that we wanted to inspire the United States and the whole world by doing this, not only by launching on time, but also by landing on the surface of Mars. And that's what we did in early February when we actually came down in the seven minutes of terror and we had the cameras on board that showed uh, how we were kicking up dust as we came down. Cameras looking up and down and cameras uh, going, uh, really looking at the rover being let down from that sky crane that's hanging out there, sci-fi made reality. Then you see when the, when the rover hits the ground, in the middle of that dust, how the sky crane at the top left flies away and then crashes into the planet. 
we have, of course, uh, all, we were all there in a room. Uh, this team that sat in the room met for the first time since COVID in the same room that hadn't occurred. They came together as a single team and they achieved a historic feat. I remember sitting there in the back of the room and being so excited until all of a sudden I learned that the president wants to call us and we were all chatting about he too, just like so many. Actually, we now know uh, billions of individuals around the, the world had looked at that content, had looked at that story of us uh, landing off the surface uh, of Mars. And uh, we're just so excited. Of course, the landing was only the beginning of the Perseverance story, and we've been very busy since. And in fact, what you're looking at right now is the fruit of the labor of that team. You see in that rock on the surface of the former lake bed uh, on Mars, you see two holes that were drilled in early September. I'll be honest with you, that the second attempt, the first attempt that we tried to take in the ground at another site was not successful. To our surprise, we realized that the material was very brittle and it frankly fell out of our sophisticated drilling apparatus. The two holes here, of course, are the indications of samples we've taken, promising samples telling us the history of that rock and that site uh, as it kind of went from a sea lake bed to a really violent flooding uh, place and then to the dryness that we currently see. And the samples are now on board as we're going forward, finding other places to sample and moving towards the time when we bring those samples back. You of course know that not only have we had perseverance on the surface of Mars, we've also brought a companion, ingenuity. Ingenuity is a little helicopter. And I tell you as a story, it's a, uh, Ingenuity is a tech demo that uh, we flew to the surface uh, of Mars, strapped to the bottom of uh, Perseverance. And frankly, our entire goal was to have only four flights. Frankly, I have to tell you, it was really exciting to get this there. And uh, I remember uh, there were at least three times where committees, very important people uh, in various places, including managers and so forth, recommended that I terminate uh, Ingenuity, uh, the helicopter that has uh, captured the hearts and minds of so many because of the, again, the team that's behind it with Mimi Young and uh, all her uh, team members that are flying that helicopter. What is shown here is, frankly, the, th the overall uh, 13th flight, pictures from the 13th flight. And the reason we're at number 13, frankly, is because after we were done with the four, the science community that uh, just between us were not that excited about uh, ingenuity because they thought it will steal their thunder. They said, wait, this is a really useful instrument. It's a scout. And frankly, we can fly places like the one you're looking at where there are dunes where frankly, we can't really drive at the rover because we've learned in previous times that we could in fact get stuck uh, with, uh, you know, in, 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 in dunes like this. So what is happening now that this, on this 13th flight, but also the other flights, is uh, we can take images and actually be a scout in this particular region uh, of, uh, of Mars going forward, uh, because we want to learn not only about places we can't reach, but also being a scout for perseverance in which we can go ahead uh, and actually figure out where we want to drive so we can drive quickly and get to the goals we want to get to at a shorter time than otherwise we could. Here's an image of Perseverance and Ingenuity taken by the arm of Perseverance, kind of in a selfie fashion. And what it shows is Perseverance in a landscape that it has achieved and has is exploring because of the team that built it, because of the team that's currently running it, an international team that's there. Right behind it is uh, Ingenuity that, of course, has become a symbol of innovation for all of us and people worldwide. Again, another team 
doing the impossible, not just because it's hard, but also doing it and finalizing this entire work during COVID. Uh, of course, uh, what I want to remind you is on, on Perseverance, we actually flew a plaque celebrating the healthcare professionals that uh, are, have affected so many of our lives and have, frankly, uh, behaved so honorably during this time under stress and under pressure. The next story about reaching your horizons is all about working together. Sometimes achieving new horizons is going outward. Sometimes achieving new horizons is coming together and looking inwards. And that's what the next story is about. And it is about the most beautiful planet we know, the planet that we explore with high focus, and that's our Earth. It's a planet that's changing, a planet that, frankly, we learn about from space more or kind of complementary um, to what we're learning on the ground, a planet in which we're all connected, we're breathing each other's air, and we, of course, are connected in a deep fashion. What we're seeing here uh, is the temperature over time taken uh, by multiple assets, uh, both from the ground and in space, coming together and showing, of course, that the temperature has increased and it is increasing. It's uh, scientifically understood why that is, and it's something that has changed our entire environment in a way that makes our planet today in many ways different than the planet that we grew up with, many of us, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because of the fact that it has a different type of atmospheric composition. It has a different type of uh, uh, overall uh, systems that are interacting with each other. To explore that, what we're doing is actually looking at the Earth in an entirely new way with an Earth system observatory we just have announced. First of all, that observatory is a single observatory made out of many missions, providing a holistic three-dimensional understanding of our Earth system and how the, the systems work together and how they change and influence each other. They start, of course, uh, with uh, surface biology, but also surface deformation and change, whether it's volcanic activity, whether it's landslides at the top. Cloud convection and precipitation is frankly an area that of course affects weather, but is very little known. We have many areas uh, that we still like to learn. We have a really hard time predicting that. Those of you who are depending on snow and, and rain predictions know that really well. Aerosols are a really important part of it. They really relate to natural sources, but also relate to human-made sources. And then overall, what we can do looking from space is not only see at the surface where mass is, whether that's water or ice, but also below the surface, for example, in the aquifers uh, in uh, around Michigan or in other places. And these can be come together into a single data system that we can use. Again, the way we're looking at it is by coming together. It's not by jumping out there by ourselves. It's by creating a coherent coming together approach with it. I want to show you some examples of that, examples that are right happening right now. The first one is a unique tool. This is one of the many tools that are there. It's called ISAT 2. And of course, just like the name said, it was initially designed to track the elevation of ice. And the elevation of ice, of course, in the polar areas where much of the changes of the sea level is coming from in glacier areas, uh, such as the Rockies, the Alps, and many others around. And so it's really important to do that. Just to give you an example, uh, what we're doing is with this satellite that is about uh, 700 kilometers or so above the surface, 475 miles over the surface, we're shooting 10,000 shots of lasers down at the Earth, and we're looking at the, the scattered light coming back up. Uh, here's one example uh, that is close to your neighborhood, and it's a Mackinac Bridge. Uh, basically, what you see here is that this spacecraft launch in 2018 uh, provides unprecedented accuracy. So you basically see, of course, as the laser is hitting, uh, you see uh, 
scattering from the water surface. You actually see that some of the laser goes down and looks at the sur at the at the bottom of the lake, which is pretty shallow there, as all of you know, who have boat there. Uh, you see the bridge, uh, and kind of uh, that is uh, where the laser is bouncing off, and then you see the land elevation and the trees that are there. This is only one example. Of course, we have the same kind of. Um, you know, traces over Ann Arbor. We have the same kind of traces during winter time when there is snow. We have the same kind of traces when there's ice is, is forming on top of uh, the lake and everywhere. So for us, understanding our planet is all about data. It's about getting data back that, that is really helping us understand where the water is, uh, in this case, where the ice is, and also, frankly, how we, as we go into a future, especially in the western part of the United States, where much of the water falls in snow in the winter time, where that, how that water needs to be managed over time as we get to drier uh, climates, um, as, uh, for example, California and many parts have uh, gone, including uh, climates in which um, uh, wildfires are much more prevalent. I love this picture because it demonstrates that capability, a capability at work for you, frankly, each and every day, each and every second for over three years. I already talked about the fact that the sea level is changing. And what I want to tell you here uh, is uh, basically uh, is the data, what I want to summarize is the data that we have collected over time. What you see uh, is, uh, first of all, we have a record of sea level taken from space that is quite accurate and frankly has been, uh, has been very much uh, with us and has guided our thinking. Sea level is very hard to measure, frankly, from the beginning, uh, you know, from in a given place, because uh, as I'm going to show you later, it's actually changing because of pressure systems and also because of geology. But this graph from 1993 to 2020 is showing the ocean levels, frankly, the rise in millimeters. So the bottom line up front and this blue line at the top, the sea level is rising at somewhere between three and four millimeters per year. So it's like that much. You say, well, how much is that? Well, it's an enormous amount of water, but uh, it's something, of course, that has impact as we're going to show not so much primarily in the state of Michigan, but uh, very much at the coastal areas where uh, so many of the biggest cities on earth are. Now you basically say, well, what's the reason for that uh, sea level change? And what, what you realize is the first part, of course, is because there's more water. There is more water as, the, as is shown here in the green uh, curve. Um, because, and we can measure that by measuring the mass. I just want to quickly tell you how we're doing that. We have two spacecraft up there that are flying next to each other, and we understand the, the distance of that spacecraft down to the accuracy of an atom, uh, kind of a, a hydrogen atom, kind of tiny little uh, accuracy. So basically what happens, of course, if there's more mass pulling at the bottom, the front spacecraft may fly a little bit farther ahead, and as it's flying over it, the, the, the spacecraft catches up in the back. Gravity, therefore, can be measured, so there's more mass there. We know how much. That mass in equal parts comes, as we've learned from the ISAT-2 and its predecessors, comes from the Arctic, Antarctic regions, and also from glacial regions uh, to 50% or so. The second contribution, Roughly a third of it is what's shown in that brownish curve, which, uh, which basically shows that, of course, the water is expanding. When it gets warmer, any material, uh, most materials, I need to say, is expanding uh, when it gets warmer. So basically, the sea level is rising, and you see the two curves really add up well to the, the blue one, which is independently measured. So we understand where that water is coming from and why the sea level is going up. This uh, is an enormous collaboration between the United States, NASA, but also by international partners. We've worked with the French, with the Europeans on providing data like that, and this is important data. 
as we go forward, because it actually talks about, especially if you're in a reinsurance business, it talks about threats in certain areas. It talks about flooding threats, especially during tides, which go on top of that, of course, if you're uh, at the coastal region. The most recent spacecraft to help us with understanding the sea level is the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, a collaboration between the Europeans and NASA really looking at sea levels as we fly around. So what is shown here are data of uh, taken between June 5th and 15th of 2021 by this spacecraft, which by the way, was also launched in the middle of COVID. You see in orange, uh, the areas that show regions where sea level was higher than norm normal, and in blue areas show regions where they're lower than normal. You see sea level is not one number because of tides, because of, pressure systems, geology, it matters where you are to figure out whether sea levels are going to affect you. And you see at the scale, frankly, the scale is enormously uh, much bigger uh, and the variability scale. So both this variability plus also the trends work together for us to understand uh, what this means. Again, this was launched uh, to orbit in November 21st, 2020. Uh, Michael Freilich, by the way, uh, is the name of a former NASA leader. Uh, he ran Earth Science. And uh, I just want you to know, this mission was led by Europe, and they put the American's name on their spacecraft, which uh, was a tremendous generosity and kind of really a point of the partnership that is enabling these kind of missions. You say, well, okay, that's nice and good. Why? Do I care about uh, sea levels like this? And uh, I want to quickly draw your attention to New York City. So what is shown here is now taken the data and integrated with, of course, altimetry data uh, that are also taken from space and basically calculating over time the flooding likelihood. Now, remember the flooding likelihood of course, as the sea level goes up, will increase in lower levels, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, areas. But on top of that, if a storm comes, if you want, a storm goes on top of all of that. So, so the, the kind of areas that uh, are prone to flooding uh, are, frankly, areas that already now uh, we have to pay attention to. So, first of all, the areas that are in yellow are prone to flooding more than they ever were right now, frankly. And what we're realizing, and of course you saw that the last hurricane, sadly, those are the areas where many more people died in New York than even in Louisiana, where the hurricane was a lot stronger. The topic of depression that went over New York, uh, frankly, killed more because of that flood level. Water, as you know, in hurricanes is the biggest reason for for a death. You see basically that uh, over the, the years of the 20s, uh, uh, you'll see an approximately a five inch uh, sea level rise and then go beyond that uh, in New York, uh, go beyond that, you know, from the 50s and 80s. And needless to say, that's speculative because frankly, what we're seeing is that the, uh, that the sea level rise, uh, go, you know, if you think back of the curve that I showed you with that blue curve, is actually tending to steepen, and we're worried about that. Now you say, well, why are these data important? And when we talk about working together, well, it's absolutely critical. Two things are, are important. Many of the areas uh, that are shown here, and frankly also uh, our good friends in Louisiana, are areas where there's tremendous poverty. And frankly, it's absolutely critical for us to work together to support our community uh, whether it's in Michigan or whether it's in areas like this, where, frankly, there is not enough money or business to help each other. This is, when we talk about coming together and building new horizons together, it's critical to see that in a comprehensive fashion and see that driven by the empathy that so many of you bring to work each and every day, as I said at the beginning. Secondly, there are many areas, many businesses that, frankly, can take ideas like this and uh, data like this that we're providing and making openly available and utilizing it for your own community 
There's areas, there's data of crop, there's data of flooding, of snow cover, of many other things. And frankly, we invite all of you, business leaders and kind of innovators, to work with us on these data and make the data useful for your own community. Because the only way we can succeed achieving this horizon is to succeed together. Succeeding together is what we do in all of our projects, like we said, whether it's on the International Space Station, kind of a, a beacon of hope and peace. Uh, sometimes, you know, together with our Russian colleagues, when sometimes the countries kind of struggle with each other, our astronauts have been there together for 20 plus years. You know, frankly, uh, the looking at our Earth and, of course, looking um, at the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to uh, launch in the near future, here shown uh, with a youngster that is really excited about this, looking at developing new uh, telescopes, new missions here, but just as importantly, here on Earth, coming together as one, crossing boundaries that sometimes people want to put on us and achieving horizons of hope, horizons, new horizons of help and empathy coming together because we see the humanity in each other and the empathy that drives us to create action. Yes, it is exciting to go outside and show and demonstrate the power of teams. It's just as exciting and so important for all of us, and especially the business community that I'm happy to address today, to come together also here and show the power of hope, the power of collaboration and empathy as we come together and help each other. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you uh, today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Thomas. Very interesting, very exciting, uh, and collaboration. Uh, and data seem to be the two words I hear consistently through the four presentations we had today. And speaking of collaboration, uh, I'm introducing now Mike Saratakis. Mike and I have been collaborating and we created this program, what, about four years ago uh, between Ann Arbor Spark and the University of Michigan's Tech Transfer Office, which is now called, by the way, Innovation Partners. Um, but Mike, it's been a pleasure, good friend. We've enjoyed putting these programs together every year. It's been exciting to get the quality of presenters that we have like today, very exciting. Uh, by the way, I don't think I ever introduced myself, Skip Sims, I'm with Ann Arbor Spark. I am now gonna exit the stage and turn it over to you. Go Mike. Thanks Skip. And uh, as Skip mentioned, I'm Mike Sarathakis. I'm the Director of Ventures at Innovation Partnerships, which in fact is a, a new name for the what was formerly known as the Tech Transfer Office at the University of Michigan. We launched that name today. Uh, so please come and uh, do a Google search. You'll be able to find uh, our new website and some of the new programs we're trying to implement uh, to help commercialize the research coming out of the University of Michigan. Um, we have very limited time and a number of questions, so I'm gonna get right to it. Thank you everyone for those presentations. They were fantastic. Um, and I'll start off with the first question. Um, the pandemic has been a hardship and tragedy that has caused disruption and change around the world. Yet some of these changes, as, you, as many of you have mentioned in your presentations, will have positive impacts on society, research, and industry in the future. So I, I would like each of you to anticipate from your own perspectives, uh, one change that will result from the challenges we've, we're facing now um, that were presented by COVID. And why don't we start with you, Mingyan? Um. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I will name the obvious one. I think we're gonna see a lot more things that are hybrid. Um, I think uh, one uh, outcome of the pandemic is we have gotten so much more comfortable at using these remote technologies, not to mention we now have a family of very good tools to uh, enable that. Um, the other thing, however, is that I think we now have a newfound appreciation for physical in-person interaction. You know, I'm on the front line of teaching and we hear this over and over again from students. Uh, that just cannot be replaced by, 
by this type of uh, technology. I think, you know, hopefully we're going to see this as an augmentation, as a way to, to make scheduling easier, uh, to bring people from different parts, uh, different parts of the world, different time zones together easier, uh, to uh, provide more greater flexibility. Uh, and yet, uh, I think it's, it's now clear there are things that this is not going to replace. But uh, I think we'll, we'll be out of this in a stronger position. Great, thank you. Uh, how about you, Peter? Yeah, I guess adversity always uh, creates opportunity, right? With, uh, to echo what uh, Mingyan was saying, uh, we've always all become more comfortable with sort of the digital world as well. And sort of in my space, in the, the blockchain, the crypto space, I mean, this has been really a, a boon. We've seen quite a bit of an acceleration of adoption of, uh, you know, distributed financing platforms of, of global trades, even for smart for small companies that can do this over uh, um, blockchain networks, uh, working with big banks. So there's so I mean, again, we see these new opportunities being created that didn't exist before and that were essentially forced upon us by not being able to, I guess, meet in person and sit around boardrooms and, and whatnot. I mean, that are now all being transacted, you know, digitally. Thanks. Thomas, what do you think? So mo the most important benefit, of course, uh, we got to know our leaders. They were always, they always had strengths and weaknesses. We got to know ourselves. Uh, we learned how we actually lead under pressure. We do that sometimes and people don't see us on camera. Uh, but we learn. So kind of, uh, first of all, we should take those lessons and uh, recognize that the lessons that we learned during that time also apply when there's no uh, pandemic. I'm going to answer uh, the, the question kind of from a point of view of uh, a guy who, uh, whose organization built spacecraft. And I just want to uh, tell you that, uh, of course, you can't build a spacecraft on Zoom. Uh, however, uh, what we learned uh, is that uh, there are quite a number of efficiency measures we can put in. Now, once you say, hey, we want fewer people in the room, which by the way is financially a good thing. Uh, also, uh, we actually learn how to do some processes much better and smoother. We learn how to shift work in a different fashion that frankly, we're not gonna lose, it's just better. We would have never gotten those ideas uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic. So, so just like uh, I was said earlier, right? There's opportunity that comes from that. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Uh, we run uh, a research program. We have a lot of peer review, uh, close to a billion dollars uh, goes through every year in which we run peer reviews. Uh, we used to do all these peer reviews by jetting people from all over the world to sit in a room. We're never going to do that again, except for areas where we need to actually have argue with each other a lot more than a, a general peer review. There are certain limits we learned, uh, kind of where interchange is really important and high bandwidth communication is needed. But we're going to save a lot of money because of the, uh, again, the motivation that we got. Thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Matt, what are your thoughts? Well, I would say um, we learned a lot about how to squeeze the in inefficiency out of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, in the example of COVID vaccines, um, COVID diagnostics, we realized that if we took a look at that process very carefully and, and with increased level of urgency about how to get from the beginning of that process to the end, we came up with lots of innovative ways to squeeze inefficiency out of that system and, and go between a idea and a product and, and really lightning speed with an equal amount of safety and effectiveness. And I think that many of those lessons are transferable outside of healthcare to other spaces. And so that's one thing. And another thing is we really, it really highlighted the need to focus more on collaboration between different components of government. So we realized that instead of just thinking of healthcare as a, one component of the federal government, we realized that we needed to work together with the Department of Defense for logistics and pandemic preparedness. We needed to work together with other components of, of HHS, like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We needed to work with the Department of Agriculture to understand how we could reach 
underserved populations that, that they reach through food distribution programs and food box programs. And I think that that attention to collaboration between the diff different parts of government will serve us well for emerging challenges in the future, whether they be related to climate change or, um, or any of the other challenges that, that we'll see. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we've had uh, several come in now um, uh, that are to the entire panel, I think would be of most interest for the audience. So uh, one of them from uh, Denise Gray is from the MEDC, um, a great discussion in innovation and technology. Um, most of you are familiar with what's going on in Michigan. So we, she asked specifically, where does Michigan have the best opportunity to take advantage of these key technologies? And what should we do to position ourselves to grow and compete? Um, Thomas, why don't we start with you on that one? <laughs> I was afraid you're gonna do that because I, <laughs> I saw five years ago, I thought I'm pretty okay understanding what Michigan can do. And I recognize that over five years, a lot changes. Uh, so first of all, Michigan is an incredible state, right? Especially uh, during the time of uh, COVID, you know, a number of people picked up their office and moved to Michigan. I know a number of new youpers who are there now uh, because they can't be there and work from there uh, because of that. So it's just an incredible capability. I, I also believe that the uh, manufacturing ec ecosystem uh, is becoming is and it will remain really important as we go forward. I do believe uh, investments in that ecosystem and, and also creating focus areas in, in areas where of course the state, you, uh, Mike and your colleagues know better than I do, uh, to really drive towards, uh, uh, you know, into depth and really create critical mass. It's, it's gonna be critical uh, as we build uh, you know, in, in, this, in this world overall. You should know in my world, space, uh, aerospace, uh, we've seen one of the largest increases ever. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, only matched, I would say, right at the, you know, kind of at, at, uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, the space world, right? Kind of the increases are going up, both in the commercial sector, which is uh, looking for areas to locate, but also uh, in the area of government. Uh, basically, every agency is up especially also the Air Force and others, right? And, and frankly, we have an enormous shortage of supply chain. Frankly, we talk about supply chain on a day-to-day -day basis. So I just uh, really think those are discussions where Michigan can lead and uh, with the good innovations from the University of Michigan and other partners will can really get uh, kind of ahead of it and, uh, and take advantage. But I'm really interested in the other answers from the panelists. Thank you, um, Matt. You know you know some of our startup projects through through your work uh, that have come out of the U. So why don't you go next? Yeah, I think uh, Michigan definitely the the combination in Michigan that is so powerful. I think is really centers around three different pieces. One is a super strong higher edu R and D intensive higher education environment. So that's really the lifeblood of early early stage innovation and that you have that in a very strong way in Michigan. Uh, the next part is really a kind of increasing amount of private sector capital investment in that's in the center of the country, but I think that you benefit from quite a bit in Michigan. So traditionally people have thought of the coasts as being the place where and specific areas on each coast as being the hotbeds of innovation. But in Michigan, there, there's an, I think there's more private investment coming to the table, more opportunities for that type of technology transfer, but also um, more opportunities for manufacturing. And a combination of those three things positions Michigan well to, to compete with the traditional powerhouses, not just in healthcare, but in other sectors as well. Yeah, I, I think you're right. We're we're certainly getting uh, better regarding the capital. Um, in fact, we just recently launched the fund ourselves, which everyone knows I'm going to plug. Right. So the Accelerate Blue Fund, uh, which we launched earlier this year, just for U of M startups. So uh, we're pretty excited about that and what that can do to accelerate companies out of the U. Um, Peter, how about you next? Yeah, I was uh, just echoing off of uh, what Thomas was saying regarding supply chains, it goes even beyond that, right? We were looking at the industries, manufacturing industry, 
uh, in Michigan and all the supply chains. I mean, they're all going digital, right? I mean, the people, the, the companies getting accolades, I mean, are the Myers of the world or the Fords of the world or of the other companies that are that are going that are going digital, that are creating efficiencies, that are uh, further automating uh, opportunities. But I want to even take it beyond that. It's sort of very non-traditional. I mean, nobody comes to Michigan thinking they're going to make it very big in finance. So I just want to talk to my own area here. Fintech, the, the purpose of, or one of the disruptive effects of Fintech means that capital doesn't need to be in New York or capital doesn't need to be in Toronto or in Chicago or elsewhere. I mean, in fact, there is actually a digital corridor being developed between Toronto and Chicago. I guess it was in between. Right. I mean, there is no reason why we can't be the tech, the tech partner to actually fuse up these two parties. And, and so th there's no reason why we cannot become a very big player in the financial technology space. In fact, even our students see it. Blockchain at Michigan, student undergraduate club consisting of um, Mingyan students <laughs> and, uh, and business students, I mean, computer science and engineering students and, and business students who actually just recently got a, the right uh, voting block right for $63 million worth of, of, of uh, uh, Uniswap currencies on a distributed exchange. So, so this is a student club. Um, and we're starting to see this whole community spread and opportunity for people that are technology savvy, for schools that are technology savvy, for a state that is very technology savvy to branch out I mean, into this space. And who knows, maybe five, 10 years, we'll be talking about Michigan as a, a major financial powerhouse. I like that idea. Ming Yan. Yeah, so I am going to say something that touches on both what Thomas said and what Peter said. Um, and again, this is through the lens of my own ex expertise. I think Michigan should go in a big way in microelectronics. And this has to do with ma uh, manufacturing, has to do with supply chain. And we, at this point, we, we have all seen or heard you just can't get anything, especially electronics. Um, I think Michigan traditionally has understood manufacturing in terms of automotive industry. It's more traditional manufacturing. Now, every car is increasingly becoming a computer, even non-electric cars. You know, how many electronic parts are in a car? It's all controlled by electronics. Where do you get those? I've had these conversations with um, people from the automotive industry. This was before the pandemic. Um, asking the question, why are you know, uh, your supply chain not in the state of Michigan, right? If you look at electronics manufacturing, we have the land. We're probably one of the few states left that have access to water. Mm -hmm. um, we climate wise, we are suited for, you know, we're not in the desert, not, not in a tropical area. The answer sometimes I receive was, well, we don't mind traveling. You know, it gives me an opportunity to go to the coast areas to visit my vendors. Well, I think all that is, is now reset. Um, so I think the state of Michigan should really rethink, you know, what manufacturing means. I think we're perfectly positioned to get into these other spaces of, of uh, high-tech manufacturing. Um, and uh, yes, I think it, it deserves serious consideration and serious investment. Thank you. So we, we have another question regarding um, supply chain. So I'm going to ask this to the two people who, who brought it up. Um, can you comment on moving away from the globalization um, of, of resources and making them more localized as, you know, and, and did COVID, has COVID impacted that? Obviously it has with the shortages we're dealing with in, in chips and semiconductors and auto now, but and doing something, as you mentioned, Mingyan, in, in refocusing on you know, microelectronics obviously would help. But is there, there are other things that we can do in regard to localizing supply chain to avoid some of these issues and your thoughts around that. Uh, and Mingyan, why don't you continue your comments since you just finished? Sure. Um, so I think, as Mike just said, we are seeing some sectors realigning um, where their suppliers are. Um, it's not just a pandemic, it's the Suez Canal, ship got getting stuck, you know, 
um, it, various things can contribute to um, to disasters. Um, I I will say though, I think some things have yet to be seen in the sense that um, depending on how long, on one hand, you know, I think everybody is hoping that this pandemic will be over as soon as possible, right? Anything to get us out of this. Uh, on the other hand, if we, and I'm not saying we, we, we I don't wish for a quick uh, a resolution, um, memory can be short. I know in some sectors, the minute you start flipping that switch and say, we're moving our suppliers out of this continent, we're moving to something else, that decision probably is going to stick because you, it's a major um, uh, investment. You, you, you have thought, thought it through uh, five years down the road, you're going to stick with that. And once those decisions made, it's very hard to unmake them. Uh, there are, however, I think a lot of sectors where this episode can become just short-lived, you know, a blip in a, in a rear view mirror. Um, and I think it is important to not let those lessons fade. Um, I don't know if I have more concrete things to offer, so I'll just leave it at that. That's great. And, and Thomas, you also mentioned it briefly. Uh, what do you think? I just want to give you an example, just so you know what we're facing, Perfect. right? So. So basically, most spacecraft that are three-axis stabilized have momentum wheels. Those are kind of uh, uh, wheels that take, uh, when the spacecraft wants to turn, takes the momentum out and spin them up. So you stay focused on one place, whether it's one of those data, you know, that I, data sets that I showed with a laser or a camera or whatever in various agencies. So basically this, and this has nothing to do with COVID or very little to do with COVID, but basically uh, this year, we had to replace because a single supplier provided basically 80% of all the momentum wheels worldwide. Uh, we had to basically, launches were stopped, uh, including my launches were delayed to the right uh, because, and they're nowhere near done because a huge cascade effect, basically launches in uh, worldwide were basically stopped because of that one supplier that we recognize now. And, you know, for what it's worth, I talked to leaders. I was a, the phone with the director of the uh, NRO and, you know, we talked to the Space Force and we all have problems. We do not believe we have an acceptable supply chain solution that can manage what we're doing. Uh, we are actually creating, a, you know, we're coming up with strategies to really try to drive kind of enhancing the supply chain that we have, but also really making commitments to, in, in some cases, see in our case, much of this is also export control, depending on how it's manufactured. So, you know, uh, kind of the suppliers from abroad uh, are not really viable in, in some areas. Uh, that's a, a small set where the export control is really providing that boundary. But we need, uh, for national security reasons and for leadership reasons, we need a supply chain in our space that, that really is, is there for us, uh, even in a time of need, uh, which we have right now. So. So we're in dire straits. I have supplies uh, that uh, in a standard kind of, uh, some, for example, an FPGA, uh, those of you know what that is, of course, to know the others, I won't worry. But, you know, an electronic part, like this, a programmable part, we have delay times that uh, are 10x longer than they were uh, two years ago. So we have, so I, I, what is, what, what our calling, uh, you know, what you just said, I, mean, I, I really agree with. There's tremendous opportunity and I think uh, a willingness, uh, you know, to for many to chat. Again, this is just my industry. I don't know. I cannot speak about others with the same authority. Great. Thank you. Um, Peter, uh, we have an interesting question regarding El Salvador's adoption of uh, cryptocurrency recently. And what are your thoughts around that? And also, do you think other countries will follow their lead? <laughs> um, this is a very interesting question. There's right now 29 countries um, that where um, central banks are um, starting to adopt digital currencies that are one-to-one -one backed with their own fiat currency, which is slightly different from what El Salvador is doing, doing that just saying we're going to go to completely digital payments. Um, there, you know, there, there has to be, uh, I mean, in my view, I mean, there, there has to be a some backing by um, 
or tied to through a stable coin with a fiat currency. We are seeing more and more of it. I mean, in fact, I wrote this paper in a, um, Bloomberg C-Lab on sort of digital financing of infrastructure. The first call I got was out of Africa. And uh, <laughs> they said, you know, we're actually applying, you know, our digital currencies, I mean, across a trans-Africa corridor from east to west. I said, why are you guys applying cryptocurrencies? So because, well, we do not trust the banks. And so basically all the payments are essentially being transacted using cryptocurrencies because of the instability and the lack of trust in the actual banking system, the, the monetary transaction system that exists. So I think it's, a, it's probably a, a fairly uh, attractive um, mechanism to be adopted by countries where you're one, have an, have an uh, unstable uh, or, or a, a, a uh, not unstable, but uh, I would say a central bank, not a very strong central bank, or not a lot of trust in the banking system in general. I mean, that's what makes potentially this, this, this attractive, but you know, it probably has its own pitfalls. We'll have to see how that's gonna work out for El Salvador uh, to do this and see you know, what, the, what the, 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 uh, the constraints are going to be about the deployment of doing that. Thank you. Um, so Matt actually uh, chimed in and I missed his chat. Uh, he has a comment about supply chain too, and given what we're going through, I thought it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, the, the pharmaceutical supply chain has been a, a massive issue during the COVID pandemic. And in June, all of the federal agencies completed 100-day reviews of, um, of their supply chain resiliency. And the, the pharmaceutical supply chain really needs some, some heavy-duty federal intervention, all the way from chemical precursors to active pharmaceutical ingredients to com complete drugs. And, and as a pandemic has pointed out, you really can't be depending on foreign countries, um, especially competitor countries for issues as critical as pharmaceuticals. So going forward, the Biden-Harris administration is very committed to strengthening the pharmaceutical supply chain and increasing the resiliency of that supply chain so that going into the future, um, even, even our most, going all the way from our most common generic drugs that are, that are necessary for life-saving interventions every day, all the way to our most advanced um, drugs like new mRNA vaccines, we have the advanced manufacturing capabilities to, to handle those challenges as they come to bear. Great. Thank you. And I, I have one more question. We're, we're winding down here to a deadline, but um, Thomas, uh, people want to know, Pluto, planet or not? <laughs> you, with your presentation, we had to ask that question. Oh uh, yeah, right. You know, it's a, it's a good question. Like you can, you can start huge arguments in science communities about that, you know, get off the, for me, uh, when I, I, the way I learned the planets Pluto is always on one of my fingers and kind of nothing matters uh, about this. Uh, the point really is if today we discovered Pluto, we would not call it a planet because there's tens of thousands of planets out there. So it's a dwarf planet. I have zero issue with anybody calling it a planet because that's what I do. Yeah, I, I noticed that you called it a planet. So I thought that'd be a good, good and fun question to end on. So um, I want to thank all of you uh, for participating. This has been fantastic. Uh, also, much thanks to my good friend, Skip. Um, we, I remember when we were conceiving this uh, four, five years ago. Um, and I think, you know, for the fifth anniversary, we're going to start looking back on what these predictions and conversations have had and, and do a review and see how good everyone's doing halfway halfway to that first one. Um, so thanks to Spark. Uh, thanks to Russell Video for managing this. It's been uh, really smooth. And uh, hope to see all of you next year at 2032, what the future holds. Take care. Sounds great. Thanks, Mike. Skip. Good to see everyone. Good to see everybody.